You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma podcast. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode. Excited to share this episode with you today. But before we do, I've got to thank our sponsors. First of all, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. They've been a huge part of this podcast for the last few years. So the Oklahoma Hall of Fame have been sharing Oklahoma's story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com. And for daily updates, go to Oklahoma HOF on Instagram and give them a follow. Our other sponsor today is Chicksaw Nation. Now, the Chicksaw Nation have sponsored pretty much everything in Oklahoma. They're a huge supporter of Oklahoma. And it's an honor to have their name and their brand supporting this podcast. So a huge shout out to Governor Anna Toby for supporting this podcast. It really means a lot. And finally, our third sponsor is 988. The Oklahoma 988 Mental Health Lifeline. 988 is a direct three-digit lifeline that connects you with trained behavioral health professionals that can get all Oklahomans the help that they need. Learn more by visiting 988oklahoma.com. That's 988oklahoma.com. And now, let's get into today's episode. Gives me great pleasure to welcome to the podcast my guest today, Dr. Catherine Jeffrey, who is being inducted into the Oklahoma City Public Schools Wall of Fame this year. Congratulations. Thank you. I suppose, you. you know, bringing you home, right? You're currently in California, a uh, current role, superintendent, president of Santa Monica Community College District. And you get a phone call saying, you know what? You've been awarded. You're, you're going to be on the Wall of Fame. How about you jump on the plane and, and come back home and receive this award? What was that like? You know, when I first got the phone message, I wasn't sure I heard it correctly. I had to listen. <laughs> You're like me? I had to yeah. listen to the message again. Um, Abby Vaughn called, and um, then she she actually um, sent me an email uh-huh. because she wasn't able to get get through on my my voicemail, and and then I read the email and then gave her uh, a call uh, immediately to make sure she uh-huh. had hit the right person. But once I processed it and really understood that this was um, a serious call, uh, especially focusing on uh, my experience in, in public school here and how that contributed to what I'm doing now professionally, I really felt strongly about um, what this type of recognition can mean for teachers. Mm -hmm. And so the teachers know that what they do truly makes a difference for for folks. Uh, And I wanted to be able to to share with people what I'm doing now. So I I really um, wanted to know who had nominated me. That actually was probably the first thing that came to mind once once I realized this was a a real invitation to be part of something that has a real solid base here in the city, but I wanted to know who had followed me. And what I've learned uh, over the last um, few months, really, since I, I got the first contact from Abby, was that you never know who's following your career. Uh-huh. You know, it may be people that you know very well, it may be people from a distance. Yeah. And I, I thought, wow. It is really nice to know that what I am doing professionally matters to someone. Yeah, especially when you're, I mean, the other end of the country, right? Exactly. When you get that phone call and you're like, people in Oklahoma still follow you and understand that, you know, this is where you came from, you know, and Mm -hmm. then obviously you went to Douglas High School and then, you know, you're you're continuing on your career path and only then will you know, right, when they reach out or you meet those people in person and say, hey, I've been following you. Exactly. We love what you're doing. Keep it up, right? I think there should be more of that in this world, <laughs> you know? So that was um, a really big deal for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I started thinking about uh, my teachers, and I didn't even realize how much of my experience from elementary school s- stuck with me. Mm-hmm. I was able to name every single teacher I had from kindergarten all the way through the sixth grade and see their faces and see myself in their classrooms. Uh, And of those teachers, I 
I realized I started looking them up online to try to find out if, if they were still living in the in the community, or if they were still living at all. And I discovered that one of my teachers, my sixth grade teacher, Dr. Evangi McGlon, she just passed in January, and she was in her 90s. January of, of, of 22, and she was in her 90s, 92, 93 years old. Yeah. And then I looked, um, uh, I found out that my third grade teacher, who was really, really special to me, um, Audrey Baker, who had been a, a principal here uh, after she left teaching third grade and she progressed in her career, and she passed Monday a week ago. Oh. And she was on my guest list yeah. because I had seen her about three years ago, and we reconnected. It was really great, and I wanted to make sure she was among yeah. my guests, and I learned that she had passed. Oh. So these, these connections just kind of stay with you. Yeah. Uh, and to... Um, be in, in the same profession, even though I'm, I'm engaged in it at a different level, mm -hmm. um, just knowing uh, what an impact those teachers had on me. Uh, I've been in the classroom. I taught music for yeah. a number of years. I'm a pianist. I uh, studied um, music here in Oklahoma City starting at age six. Um, my music teacher lived in the block uh, down the street from me mm -hmm. over in Northeast uh, Oklahoma City, uh, Lucy Alexander, and many of the teachers lived in the neighborhood. Teachers from Crescent Hills, from from then Kennedy, it has a different name now, uh, and Douglas High School, they all lived in the neighborhood. Yeah. So your teachers, your preachers, your community leaders, your politicians, they were all, we were all part of a, a vibrant neighborhood. We all knew each other. Uh, you, and, and there was this closeness of community, and I have, um, you know, honestly been very fortunate to grow up in that type of setting. I didn't realize at the time how important that was going to be to me later in life, but uh, it was a wonderful foundation. Yeah. So, so growing up in that, you know, you just named named some great teachers of yours and people who you looked up to. Is that, you know, are they the reason that you went into education then? You know, I, I don't know if I would say they were the reason. Sure. Um, sometimes I'm not sure uh, exactly what pushed me in that direction, except for this, this one thing um, I know um, was part of my motivation, and that is the fact that at the time I grew up in the 60s, mm -hmm. A lot of uh, social activism around social justice, uh, organizing to create uh, equality for uh, racial equality and, uh, here in the community. And we were part of the sit-ins in downtown Oklahoma City and other parts of, of, of the city. Segregation on buses and in other places and the lunch counters, all of that existed during my, my youth. Um, so my motivation to pursue higher education myself came from knowing that that was one of the doors that had been closed. Um, and there were people working hard to open that door wide for, for me and others to have access to higher education. So once I um, uh, really found my way uh, along that path of pursuing higher education for myself, I found that I really liked it. And I originally started out uh, toward elementary school teaching yeah. as a music teacher. And I was going to teach uh, K-6 K, uh, elementary. And Elementary school children are so much fun to teach music. They do the songs, they do the motions to the songs. You know, Head, Shoulders, Baby was one of the songs we used to do, and you, you animate the songs. And then I got to junior high school student teaching, and the students at junior high school, their minds were on everything else but the music. Uh, and that was a bit of a challenge. And somewhere along the way, I decided I liked working with adults. Mm -hmm. 
and I ended up in this higher education direction, and that was really the niche for me. Yeah, and that's where I've stayed. Yeah, and that's kind of like I said, you find your way, right? You find yeah. your yeah. You're, you're molding young minds, but molding young minds that are ready to go in the workforce or ready to go become teachers themselves. I mean, right. it's, you, yeah, I, I, teaching is such a skill at every level, I think, and you've got to be very good at it, you know, to be a kindergarten teacher, to teach adults, like there's such a different delivery, right? You can't teach them the same way. And, you know, I look back and, and I'm sure people listening, and we've all had this experience, is we all remember those teachers who kind of changed our minds a little bit or who gave us a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of confidence or, or I mean, there's so many people that we can think of, but it's such an important role in, you know, your upbringing is the teachers that you have, right? That's right. And even as far back as kindergarten, Mrs. Barkley, um, my first teacher here, uh, and she lived for a very long time. I believe she even just passed only a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And each of those teachers made an impression in a way that made me excited about education. Uh, and even the teachers who were more rigid or more strict, um, they also have stayed with me. I remember one, her name was Isabel Nelson, and I had acted up in school one day. I was in the fifth grade, um, and Mrs. Nelson uh, decided that she would um, make that a learning experience for me. And when I got home from school, Uh, There was a car parked in front of the house that I didn't recognize, and when I got to the front door, my mother said, come on in. And I thought, oh, who's the company? And it was Mrs. Nelson sitting inside the house talking to my mom. And uh, my mother, I could tell just by the expression on her face that Mrs. Nelson had already told her about my shenanigans when I was in class that day. And I don't even know what motivated me to... um, express myself in the way that I did, which clearly now when I reflect back on it was disrespectful and inappropriate. But she uh, said to me in front of my mother that she was at my house because she knew that I knew better and she knew that there was more in store for me. And I really needed to take uh, my time in school seriously and that she was in she was willing to invest her time in me and I needed to be willing to invest the time in myself that made an impression and it stayed with me it stuck with me it was a teachable moment yeah this it's powerful right yeah because I mean and also because she's doing that she's not getting paid to come see you that's after hours, right? Yes, That's totally on after her. Hours, right. You know, so totally on her. And you to never do that. know what you're going to find no, you don't. when you walk to someone's front door. You don't know how the parents are going to receive you, right? Uh, and you certainly don't know how the parents are going to receive you these days. Mm-hmm. But uh, then, as I said, we were a community. Yeah. So many of the teachers knew our parents. In fact, I, my mother may have even known Mrs. Nelson, and I may not have known yeah. that there was that connection. Yeah. You know, sometimes you don't you don't learn these things until much later in life that these are folks who either went parents uh, of my friends who grew up together, went to high school together, grew up in the same towns before their families moved to Oklahoma City, all kinds of connections. So um, I just had a tremendous opportunity to um, to take what I got from uh, Crescent Hills Uh, from Kennedy and from Douglas and to really use that in critical ways to uh, further my uh, success. And I just appreciated those teachers so much. So this recognition for the role of public education to to me is is one that I take uh, to heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, you're a community, right? And I, I and you've been in this business, you know, for, for four decades and, and seen so much stuff happen, whether it's, you know, diversity, you know, wars that are going on. I mean, so much stuff has happened. What is different now? I think we, the sad thing is I think we're coming back to that need for community now, mm-hmm. right? Everyone's like 
being pushed apart, polarizing, whatever it is, by whether it's politics or anything. You know, we've all seen the news. What are your thoughts now then on on everything that you've been through and everything you've seen, and and just general idea of like, I mean, we need to get back to like community and. You know, it, it just seems like it's going in a direction that something bad seems to happen or is going to happen. It's just going to get a whole lot worse. Um, I think we need to, um, I think communities are better served when we look out for each other. Mm-hmm. When we um, do, do things for the right reasons, for the greater good. Not just not just uh, for selfish ways, selfish reasons. I also um, think civility is important. Um, social graces matter. <laughs> um, you uh, building relationships with people, um, building connections that uh, create unity, bring people together rather than push people apart. I think that's important. Um, I think working across the different groups who live in our community, not being, um, not just keeping to those individuals who are most familiar to you. I think you open up your capacity to learn and engage in the world when you reach across boundaries and connect with folks who come from a lot of different places and a lot of different ways of thinking. Um, And it not only broadens your perspective and, uh, and creates the ability for you to exist meaningfully and peacefully in a lot of different communities, it makes you, um, I think, stronger in terms of knowing what's of value to you. Um, So those are some of the things that have helped me as I've uh, moved from Oklahoma City and lived in a few different states. Uh, uh, I've experienced some international travel. It took me many years to get to international travel, but once I did, I even realized that within the United States, um, we don't have the golden ticket on how to live. There are many places outside of this country where there are wonderful life lessons to be learned um, about what community means. Um, And I... My eyes have just been opened yeah. in ways um, that I never thought possible when I initially started out here in Oklahoma yeah. City. But it, but it started right here with public schools and the readings and the opportunities to attend um, artistic events downtown, mm-hmm. uh, dance, go to musical concerts and things that elevated my sense of music, musical style. Uh, and I ultimately majored in music in college. And I mentioned Mrs. Alexander, my piano teacher, and, and Leroy Hicks was our choir director at, at Douglas, and Cornelius Pittman was the gentleman who got me started with strings when I was a, in the fifth grade. And I had long arms, long fingers, so he said, I think a viola will fit you. <laughs> so I started playing viola, and I yeah. played viola all the way through to the senior year of college. Yeah. And I played in the university orchestra. All of these things I continue to do, um, and music is still a part of my life right now. And I, and so these, and, and I think that's why I started in in the direction of music um, to teach music at the elementary level. I actually ended up teaching at the college level. I taught music history, music theory, music. Uh, literature, and I taught uh, be- beginning and intermediate, intermediate piano, uh, and I I never thought that that would be um, my path, right. and I ultimately ended up in higher education administration, but all of that for me started right here in Oklahoma City on Northeast 21st Street, yeah. and I appreciate this place. And I appreciate the contributions to my life that started right here. And although I'm leading a a substantial uh, student population, uh, 26,000 students uh, at at Santa Monica College in uh, Santa Monica, California, all of that started right here 
yeah. in Oklahoma City. And my parents moved from Arcadia, a small town outside of Oklahoma City. And now Arcadia has even grown. Arcadia is now Edmond, right? Yeah, <laughs> just Arcadia has even two, grown. Two different, yeah, so someone at the event that. on uh, Monday said yeah. to my brother, Wow, from Arcadia to Santa Monica, California. From Arcadia, Oklahoma to Santa Monica, yeah. California. That's that's quite a quite a transition, and indeed it is. Yeah, definitely. And and to that point, you, you know, you mentioned you go into music and you start teaching music. What is that? What is that time then when you when you transition into administration and then into a leadership role? Because I mean, you are a leader as a teacher. But there's totally different things than when you go into administration and you're leading other teachers to do their thing and, and ultimately go down the path that you are at now. Well, higher education... Because I assume that's, that's what takes you out of the state. I'm sorry. Is that you, what ends up taking you out of the state? Uh, it is. Okay. It is what, what did it. I, um, when I first started searching for uh, positions graduating from Oklahoma State University with my master's, mm-hmm. uh, I looked closer to home. I looked at Texas... Uh, I looked at um, places where some of my my schoolmates had moved, so I would have friends and community uh, if if I were fortunate enough to get those jobs in those places. But ultimately, um, I found an opening in in California, and they interviewed me uh, not via Zoom, <laughs> but by telephone. Yeah, because Zoom didn't exist at that time, and I had a telephone interview. They had never seen me, and I got the job, and I moved to Sacramento, California, and worked in residence halls. Yeah. And the kicker for that was that I had worked in residence halls almost every year uh, while I was attending at Oklahoma State University. I started uh, in my uh, sophomore year working in residence halls at OSU. And that ultimately became my first professional uh, job full-time was in uh, housing. Yeah, as an RD? I was a a residential advisor and then became a head resident, uh, uh, assistant head resident actually at at OSU. Yeah. In uh, Willard Hall, an assistant head resident at uh, Bennett Hall. and Willard no longer is a residential hall. It's a, a office building for the School of Education, I believe, at OSU now. Yeah. But the, the residential experience was very much a, a springboard for other positions that I was able to uh, achieve at, at other colleges. Yeah. Uh, when I would interview for positions as vice president for student affairs, if the college had residential halls, then I had that experience I could draw on. Uh, and sometimes I think I knew too much <laughs> about what it was like Seen to live in residential yeah. halls. But I, I have enjoyed this path, and, and I've been able to weave all of it together. Um, and with each new step that I took, um, I became more keenly aware of how what I had done in my earlier stages of work and growth had prepared me for those new challenges that I was, you know, moving towards. So yeah. it's been a journey. Yeah, no doubt. What, uh, what What's it like when then, when you get that job in California and you're like, I'm hitting the road. I'm going. Like, I mean, had you ever been to California before? That's got to be like a, a Only nervy, to visit. Yeah, it's kind of, I mean, it's a big step to go from go yeah. from you know OSU all the way to California. Only to visit family. Yeah. Um, I have a sister who lived there. Okay. My sister Carol lived in Southern California, and she was the one um, that I you know when I would visit her in Southern California. Uh, I got a chance to see what was going on in Southern Cal. But I actually ended up working in Northern California. California is such a big state. Yeah. And um, North State is so different from Southern California. It's more like Oklahoma City. In fact, my mother uh, came to visit me in Sacramento, and she says, wow, this is so much like being in Oklahoma City. I can see why you like it here. Yeah. Uh, Very similar. It's level. uh, flat <laughs> and in other parts of California there are a lot of mountains and uh-huh. you know uh, 
things that make your ears pop when you're driving along uh, the highway. And we don't get that here, do we? <laughs> we don't get that here. No, not really. <laughs> yeah. And so that that was, it felt comfortable. It felt like a place I already knew. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in fact, at Sacramento City College, where I worked in the early part of my career, uh, I moved, took other jobs, and ended up coming back to Sacramento City to serve as president. And I was president there for eight years. Yeah. What? So, over over your time in education, is there any is there a moment that stands out that kind of uh, defines you as a leader, or just kind of stands out as? This was a moment when, when, when I was tested a little bit, and 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 you know the outcome of that, and and you look back on that in a certain way. Is there anything that stands out? Um, well, I've had several tests along <laughs> the way. Um, you know, one of the things. <laughs> This is probably going to sound silly, but one of the things that stands out for me was the first time a student came into my office and said he wanted to start um, a marijuana club. (laughs) (laughs) He wanted to start a marijuana club, but he called it the hemp club. Yeah. And what I learned from this student was all the different ways you can use hemp. Because my uh, knowledge of, of uh, marijuana wasn't tied to um, hemp as a product that can be used to make um, a substance that uh, mimics wood yeah. mm-hmm. or rope or lotion or the variety of things that you can use to uh, use from hemp, um, can, can uh, derive from hemp. And I thought surely this was the thing that someone had sent to yeah. to be a test for me. Yes, yeah. And he was so serious about this hemp club, and I thought I cannot approve a hemp club for him. But ultimately, I did approve the hemp club for him yeah. because uh, the notion of the club was far beyond what I initially thought so it was a, a, a moment for me to learn some new things and uh, the student uh, approving that that club for the students did not cost me my job which I thought surely it would <laughs> and I've in fact found that there were other hemp clubs that were popping up at other colleges yeah. <laughs> so that was one of the things that challenged me. It's not a big earth shattering thing, right. but it, at that time, because it this, was, this was yeah. illegal yeah. Uh, from my perspective, but mm-hmm. there are different, uh, the plant uh, cultivated in certain ways creates the, the, um, the marijuana that people smoke yeah. uh-huh. uh, versus the, um, the hemp that, uh, is, is, does not give you the euphoria or whatever, and it is very viable and has um, the potential to be quite an industry, as we now know. Right. Uh, and people are are benefiting it uh, from it in ways. And I'm, what I have seen also is that, um, and in fact, I think it just happened. At Cal- I know it just happened in, Cal- in California. Um, that we're um, the legalization of mm-hmm. even having certain amounts of, of uh, you know, I don't know how I got off on this, but the, uh, of marijuana is is for personal use and, sure. and even in public places, it it's the kind of thing I never would have imagined right. possible. Yeah, especially when I knew so many people were in jail. Yeah, mm-hmm. for this. Yeah. And now, and now out, it's think, a major right? cash crop in yeah. many states, yeah. even in Oklahoma. Yeah. So <laughs> that was that was a um, a thing that I had to um, deal with with the student with the hemp club. Yeah. And then maybe another thing that um, challenged me was when I had to make those first decisions, hard decisions um, about. Um, what direction we wanted to take programs and services. Uh, in some places where I've lived, we've had high numbers of uh, students who come from other other parts of the world. And uh, when I lived in Sacramento, there was a, 
uh, a large population of international students who lived, uh, who came into Oklahoma and came into Sacramento when I lived in Minnesota. There were a large pop, there was a large population of international students who came uh, into uh, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and other parts of the state there. And in Oklahoma, I didn't have much experience yeah. with international populations. And so this, again, uh, became part of the lessons that I learned about how to, to, to serve more and more um, students and address their particular needs uh, when they arrive at our doors, uh, the doors of the college. And um, Minnesota students were coming from Somalia. Yeah. Uh, in Sacramento, they were coming from Russia. Uh, where I work now, we have students from so many different parts of the world. We have a very large international program, and we are the third largest um, uh, international student population, uh, I think it's in the country. Wow. Uh, yeah. That's a lot. So we compare uh, the largest uh, programs are in, uh, one is in Northern California, and one is in Texas, yeah. San Antonio, Texas area. I mean, it plays right into your hands, right? Of just diversity education and everything you've done for you know, your, your, the role that you've, you're in is I, I, the reason I love doing this is when you you know you sit with someone and you piece together kind of, and they slowly get it too. If because not we don't really get to talk about ourselves very often and talk about our stories, and you're just like. Yeah, like I get where I'm at now because of all these little steps that along mm -hmm. the way have developed my story and my path. And whether you take a left turn or a right turn, you know, you end up in, in where you're at now. And one of the other things that I think is super important for, for people in, in, in most roles, but doesn't have to be in any role in, in particular, is having mentors. And those mentors, you mentioned some great teachers mm -hmm. early on, but I'm interested to know if you have any mentors now and you know, people who you still chat with, consult with? Hmm, I do. I would say maybe my first mentor mm -hmm. was my next door neighbor okay. in Creston Hills, yeah. Mrs. Gracie, and she was a teacher. And she used to, she used to um, practice with me the things she was going to do with students in her classes. So I would do these little educational games and learned that I could, I was good at them. Uh, and she encouraged me. So someone who kind of makes you see yourself differently and makes you understand your potential, that's where it started. So she was the first friend teacher that I had. Um, another person who is my mentor, um, to this day is uh, one of my former bosses, her, Pam Fisher, who is, she lives in um, Montana now. But um, Dr. Fisher was my chancellor uh, when I worked at Columbia College, part of the Yosemite Community College District in Northern California, actually Central California. And Pam has stayed with me and given me uh, guidance uh, along my career. And one of the things she said to me uh, after an incident, this was a tough situation that I had to deal with with a, a colleague that I supervised. And it disturbed me, the, the situation that I had to manage through this was very disturbing to me. And uh, I was emotional about it. And Pam said to me, Catherine, you've got to get a thicker skin. And I asked her, why did why did people have to be so mean, yeah. mean-spirited? Uh, because this is one of the, the situation I had to deal with had to do with someone just being mean um, uh, for, no, for what I felt was no reason. Mm -hmm. And Pam said, you have to get a, thicker, get a thicker skin because you will not be able to please everyone. And everyone is not going to do things in the way that you think yeah. they should. And I think I have developed that thicker skin, but I also believe I've maintained my sense of uh, being, being um, my sense of humanity. Yeah. 
uh, my ability to be compassionate, my ability to make the tough decisions, but at the same time, um, not necessarily be a hard ass about it. Yeah. Uh, and to um, not take the authority that's invested in my position, that, that's vested with my position, um, not to take it uh, too seriously or to use it in ways that um, are ego-driven, I've maintained a good sense of self. Yeah. And that was not just from um, the lessons I learned in how to be a good person in, in, in the household, you know, things, lessons from my mother and father, uh, Percy and Esther Jeffrey, but also from um, the lessons that I learned at church. You know, religion used to be a catalyst in, in homes, not as much these days as it used to be. Um, we even have arguments about what's, what's the truth. Yeah. Uh, now there are schools of study around what's, what is the truth. Uh, and all of these things, even religion, these are constructions. And the constructions vary based on where you live in the world. And uh, what time period uh, you you. Um, experience in your life um, and I've become a much more critical thinker around so many different topics because I was able to soak up what I learned here but also to venture beyond here yeah. uh, this was a great launch pad for me uh, it has been a great launch pad for many other people. Um, and ironically, I, I live in a community where Will Rogers Park uh, is just literally uh, across the street yeah. from where I am. So I have one of Oklahoma's favorite sons uh, in terms of what he was able to accomplish in his life just very nearby, so I'm never far from someone who has Oklahoma ties yeah. because the, or, or either a person who's still living or a person whose impact is felt in the community. Yeah. I've been real fortunate. Even when I first moved to Sacramento and was working in residence halls at, at Sac State, California State University, Sacramento, one of the students who came to check into the dorm yeah was the daughter of a sixth grade teacher from Creston Hills. And Mr. Smith, Mrs. McGlon was my teacher. Mr. Smith had the other group of sixth graders. Yeah. And when the young lady checked in and her mother and uh, was asking me where I was from, I said, I'm from Oklahoma City. And she said, oh, my father taught in Oklahoma City at Creston Hills. I'm like, really? And she described her dad and I couldn't quite put it together. And she says, I want you to come to my house for Thanksgiving. And I went to have dinner with the Smiths. And as soon as I walked in the door, I recognized Mr. Smith. It was like, whoa. It was, I, I really, it took me all the way back to yeah. being on the playground at, at, at Crescent Hills. Yeah. And Mr. Smith said, Catherine Jeffrey, I do not believe this. He knew me. Yeah. And he told his daughter when she related to him that I was from Oklahoma City and had gone to Crescent Hills, he says, I know who she is. You tell her I want you to invite her for Thanksgiving. And when she comes, we're going to reconnect. And sure enough, it was a wonderful time to reconnect. So I have never in my whole career been far away from someone who was connected to Oklahoma City. Yeah, that's amazing Yeah, to have that, right? You never would have guessed that. You I never, never, know. never, and also never, to have that never. friendship community come over Thanksgiving. Yeah, you know, and so I watched over his daughter yeah. and her roommate during their uh, entire time at at uh, California State University. Uh, there was that connection; it, it felt like family. Right. Yeah. Uh, for for them to be in my dorm, they could have checked into any dorm. Right. You know, what were the chances that they would check into my dorm? Yeah. 
Love it. Taking stuff a little bit away from, from the teaching side of things, you know, obviously music's a huge passion of yours. You still play now, you're still singing now as just stuff that, you know, you don't do for work and it's just purely just to kind of de-stress you and just enjoyment factor. I don't sing as much anymore. Okay. Um, and my mother used to say, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. <laughs> And it's, it's not lost completely, but it's yeah. not as strong. The skill is not as strong as it was at one time. But uh, when I was a counselor at uh, Sac, uh, Sac City College earlier in my career, because I worked at City, Sac City twice. Yeah. Uh, earlier, I left, and then I came back as president. But when I was there in the first, uh, for the first 10 years, um, I came... Uh, my path crossed uh, the bass player for Miles Davis. And he came into town and connected with a friend uh, who was a drummer who still lives in Sacramento, uh, LeGrand Rogers. And we ended up connected, and they needed a vocalist to be part of a a little ensemble, they were going to do a gig at a local restaurant. You, know, you go to restaurants and you have the music on one side and the bar area, then you have the restaurant on the other side. And they said, we want to do a, a performance, but we need a singer. And I, Catherine, would you do, would you do this? I'm like, oh no, I don't want to do that, but, but I do want to do it. Of course it. you do, yeah. And I, I uh, worked on the songs with them, and I got a chance to spend uh, two nights, it was just two nights, uh, singing with this ensemble with this major um, bass uh, player, the drummer, um, me as the vocalist, and someone on keyboards. And my vice president, I was a counselor then, and my vice president for student uh, services came to the event one of the two nights. And when we finished uh, the set, he came up to me afterwards. And he says, Catherine, why, why are you a counselor? You should be doing this. This is what you should be doing. Yeah. But I never felt that I had the, um, the personality to be on stage like that. So it's actually ironic that in my daily work, I'm yeah. always in front of people. I'm having to do presentations. I'm having to stand in front of people and speak uh, extemporaneously. I have to take on a role that is not, that has not always been comfortable for me, uh, but I've grown into it. And uh, so oftentimes what I, I share with people is that just because you don't like to do something doesn't mean you can't do it. So I have become uh, skilled at managing m myself uh, in large groups, small groups. Sometimes I do it better than others. I'm not always 100% each time I do it, but yeah. um, that is something that I have, um, I've managed to, uh, to do in my work but I'm an, I'm an introvert uh, by nature. And so it kind of goes against what I would do um, instinctively uh, to serve as, as president, because oftentimes I have to, to address people, to address students, address the public, the community, uh, be engaged in politi political arenas, uh, to, be, to be out, outward facing. Um, more than uh, inward facing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, finishing up then, is there anything like, obviously, you know, you, you're, you're in California, you're in Sacramento, uh, sorry, Santa Monica, and, you know, you've been away from Oklahoma, but you've come back, you could have a great visit here, see family, you know, taste some of Oklahoma City's better restaurants, see the change that's happening here. But for, for people listening that are that, that might know you as, you know, an educator in Santa Monica, is there anything that, that you kind of want to talk to them about? You know, obviously people in Oklahoma know most of the stories you've told, but is there anything that, that's, that we might not know in Oklahoma, but the people in Santa Monica uh, have coming up? Is there any issues or anything going on? 
Well, in Santa Monica, we have a bond measure that will be on the ballot in November, mm -hmm. and it will give us uh, funding that will support uh, construction of new facilities that uh, we really need in order to have the type of technology to um, create classroom environments that are more nimble. If COVID taught us nothing in higher education, we've learned that this, the traditional classroom uh, is not uh, the classroom that is most, is, is not very flexible at all. And we, in uh, putting our many of our classes into remote uh, operation distance education mode, uh, we have, we need to find a bridge between DE and uh, in-person in instruction, and we're doing some hybrid and asynchronous um, classes, but our old classrooms just didn't allow us to have the connectivity that we needed uh, for, uh, to convert easily those uh, on-ground classrooms into uh, also an asynchronous uh, environment. Yeah. So this bond measure will help us to create the classrooms that give us greater capacity mm -hmm. to be flexible and, and manage in a lot of different learning modes. We also have some facilities that are old and aging and they just need to be torn down and yeah. reconstructed. Um, and we have some, we have some uh, classrooms that served um, for example, I think it was our auto tech program. Uh, I know it was our auto tech program. And the restrooms for women in the auto tech classroom area, uh, there was one, and the restroom uh, for men uh, had nine stalls. <laughs> It's, so this is just out of sync with where we are Simple today. Math, right? today. Yeah. <laughs> so it needs to be modernized yeah. And, yeah. and gender neutral restrooms right. now. We just have to do things differently. Yeah. And so that costs money. Yeah. And the bond measure will help us to, um, to meet those um, emerging uh, right. needs of the institution. And I know here in Oklahoma City, there will be uh, a measure on the ballot uh, here. And I just want to do a shout out to anyone who might hear uh, this podcast and ask people to support the Oklahoma City um, bond and vote yes, yeah. vote yes for that. Yeah. Because the way that the funds will support a public education across all sectors of the city, serving all students in the city, um, is, it's vital. Uh, that need is vital. And the, uh, I cannot underscore enough um, the need for my bond to pass in <laughs> Santa yeah. Monica for Santa Monica College. Yeah. Uh, vote yes for the bond measure. Vote SMC bond. In fact, it has our initials on it. Oh, SMC is go. the name yeah. of the bond. Yeah. And the uh, also vote yes for the measure here in yeah. Oklahoma City to support Oklahoma City Public Schools. Yeah. We know the schools need as much help as they can get. Sadly, we shouldn't have to ask for that in the modern world, but that is the sad reality, isn't it? Um, but thank you so much for telling some great stories. Uh, congratulations again on being inducted into the Oklahoma City Public Schools Wall of Fame this year. Uh, you're amongst some incredible people as well. I've, I've had the pleasure of just interviewing Dr. Hansen last week and, and also looking at the other names. And I'm sure, it, like, like you said earlier, it's a proud moment for you to come back um, and, and just kind of acknowledge the people who were there for you growing up, the community that was there, the teachers, your neighbor who taught you, who used you to test her school games and school, like that. that's that's super fortunate for you to be in that position, right? And, and be there and just timing's great and, and circumstances, it, you know, it's, you've got a lot of people in your corner and that, I, that, I, I get that passion from you as well. And I can see it in, you know, the passion you have and, and the love you have for those people. And I obviously, you know, you wouldn't be where you were if you didn't share that love and give that love to the kids that you serve now. So I can definitely see it. I, I am so appreciative of, the, of this nomination. Uh, it, it came from three of my classmates 
Uh, one I'm in contact with a lot, one less so, and one rarely. But we still all connect with each other uh, and have stayed connected over time. Yeah. And one is a friend who goes back to my elementary days. We sang in the church choir together from about age eight. The second person we met in at Kennedy, um, and he was a social justice advocate. And following his lead, I kind of saw some opportunities there to make a difference here in the city. And then the third person in college, uh, after our high school days, we actually ended up pledging a sorority together. We were on the same pledge line. Uh, so each of us have maintained a connection over time. And I just want to acknowledge Anna Sharp, Anna Knight Sharp, James Johnson, who was the president of our class, and Linda D. Brown for the nomination. Um, to be my friend is one thing. But to pay attention to my life's work and to see that as meaningful uh, and, to, and to nominate me for this um, humanitarian award for Oklahoma City Public Schools Foundation for me uh, was a gift and uh, an expression of um, not just an expression of support for what I do, mm -hmm. but an expression of care and appreciation f for all of those teachers that we all had who contributed to who we all ultimately became. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out to, to chat with us and share some stories. And finally, congratulations again. It's incredible. And I get the feeling you're not done yet. So plenty more lives to mold and, and things to do back when you get to California. Uh, but for those people listening, uh, thanks so much for tuning in. And we will catch you in next episode. Cheers. Hope you guys enjoyed that great episode. Thank you so much for listening. As always, huge shout out to our sponsors, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, share an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com and follow them on Instagram for daily updates at Oklahoma HOF. Our other sponsor, the Chickasaw Nation, amazing sponsor they do amazing things for the state and they're always sponsoring something in oklahoma they're a huge supporter of oklahoma and without their support we wouldn't be able to do what we do and finally our third sponsor for today the oklahoma 988 mental health lifeline 988 is the direct three-digit lifeline that connects you with the trained behavioral health professionals that can get all oklahomans the help that they need learn more by visiting 988oklahoma.com it's 988oklahoma.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.